Brother Booker, wonderful friend to the Apostolic Church tonight. Wonderful brother in the kingdom of God. We appreciate the depth and the passion of the word of God that he delivers to us. And as he comes tonight, I want you to extend your hand toward him and pray the blessing of God upon his home, his family, and the church back in California. Pray God anoint his life tonight. Brother Booker. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, let's give the Lord a good hand clap. My God, you're mighty. My God, you're mighty. Oh, hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. Woo. Oh, thank you, Lord. My, my, my. Now, the Lord was in this place last night. He really was. But he is really in this place tonight. And he really is. He really is. And uh, I know that God is always open for business. He really is. But there are some moments and some places and times in the road of life where it's like the stirring of the waters. Uh, you're, you're a fool if you just sit there. Whatever you got to do to get in that pool, brother, now's the time to dive in with all your heart and all your soul. And I don't want to be ugly, and I don't, certainly don't want anybody to be hurt, but if somebody gets in your way, you got to get in the pool. Shove them, man. Get in the pool. Whatever you got to do. While you're standing, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter number 10. Let me say that I, again, appreciate the invitation to be here. On whatever wise it was, I'm, I'm like the, the, I'm like, the girl in the world that didn't get asked to the dance very often. It's just good to be here, praise God, for whatever reason. <laughs> and I'm enjoying this fellowship. I'm enjoying the word. And I do believe that in every service somewhere, there is a word for you. And certainly in this conference, pastor, pastor's wife, there is a word for you. And you will find God Almighty talking to you. Not just through the word and the spirit, but in that Rima, anointing presence, touch, thorough exploding power of God. And I'm, 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 I'm appreciative for God and for that. Thank Brother Clark for the good word last night. All day long, I've been clapping my hands different. And I've been saying, God, help me to, help me to think new thoughts and see new things. And, and whatever i got to do, do different. I'm ready in Jesus' name. And I'm not kidding. I mean it. And then to be with Brother Samuel Emery. A unique individual in the kingdom of God and a powerful man of God. We heard from God today. I'm going to tell you, we heard from God. And then, of course, my very, very good friend, Brother Nathaniel Wilson, who I love and appreciate. There are five people in my life that I have concluded affect me more than any other five people in my life. That is excluding my wife and my children, five ministers. And he's one of those that are in that top five. And I listen very closely and watch very closely. Amen. And he's been a tremendous inspiration to me. And I just want to make this statement. I know you're standing. I know we got another minister coming. We'll be fine. My wife and I just recently... Uh, 
we flew a uh, lady down from Canada. She's a pastor's wife. Pastors, her and her pa- husband pastor a home missions church up in the broad expanse of Canada. Just to, just to do something, yes, nice. And uh, she was, she told us something that was really powerful. And uh, they had went to no limits. And uh, she said she was in the ladies' restroom and said, this is a home missions church. They pastored 11 people and said she got to talking to someone from the Rock Church there and, and who are you, where are you from, and so glad you're here, and pastor's wife, and we're doing a missions work. And, and then the lady asked the question, how large is your church? And she winced because, you know, sometimes you're glad to tell and sometimes you ain't so glad. And she said, well, we have 11 people so far. And the lady in the church said, praise God. What an awesome opportunity for growth. How awesome that is. How neat that is. And that, that pastor's wife told my wife and I said, I'll never forget that as long as I live, regardless of how large our church grows. And she said, I walked out of that restroom feeling 10 feet tall. You know, there's just a way you clap your hands. There's just a way you look at things. There's just, there's got to be something in here that just helps us. Amen. I want to begin reading at verse number 46 of Mark chapter number 10. Mark 10, 46. And they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy. Have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man saying unto him, be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he casting away his garment rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Let's ask that God would anoint all of our hearts together tonight. Lord Jesus, we need your touch. We need your mighty breath of life. We need your understanding, God. We need your grace and glory to explode in hearts and minds and in spirits and in lives and homes and churches and in our cities, God. Do the work, God, that only you are able to do and help us to do what only we are able to do in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Now, I'm going to give you the title of uh, my remarks tonight. I seriously doubt that what I have to say is original in that you have never heard something along this line before, but I got out of that business a long time ago when I found out that, amen, there's nothing new under the sun. But there is something about God and his wisdom and his ways and his might and the exceeding beauty of his word 
that is able to absolutely quicken and teach us repeatedly. So without giving you an original or catchy or flashy or exciting title, but hopefully it's one, you know, the tape brother can remember, praise God, I'm sure he can. It's called How to Break Out of a Rut. How to Break Out of a Rut. Amen. Now, there may be a lot of definitions of rut. I will simply give you this one. It is a pattern of behavior, usually, of course, in the negative or at least non-productive column. But it, regardless, it's a pattern of behavior that is not escaped from easily. Hence, the rut part. This is the reason that when a year begins to close and a new year with hopefully so much promise awaits millions of people around the world, they do what is commonly called New Year's resolutions in attempts, hopefully successful but oftentimes not, in attempts to escape from whatever rut they have on their mind. Amen. A rut is simply like a bed. They're easy to get into, but they're hard to get out of. Amen. A rut we've all heard described as a grave with both ends kicked out of it. And they're easy and they're slippery and they're tricky. Amen. How things can develop into such deep ruts. Amen. Even good intentions can fall into the category of being rutted and rooted in mediocrity and nothing getting done. I'll never forget reading one time a short little vignette by the very great, in my mind, author James Harriet. He was no Dostoevsky, amen, or Leo Tolstoy, but he was still good. And he wrote a lot of short stories about veterinarians, perfect for reading before you go to bed at night. But he did not He's passed away now. He died at 76. But he never wrote a word for literary sale purposes until he was past 50 years of age. And for many years, while he was a veterinarian, he kept telling his wife, I'm going to write a book someday because I'm telling you, I have so many funny experiences that happened to me. And so he said that, amen, year in and year out and year in and year out until he was past the age of 50. And finally, his wife one day said, James, get off of it. And he said, what? She said, you're over 50. You've been telling me that for over 15 years. You ain't never going to write nothing. So quit talking about it. You're not going to do it. And he said it shocked him and stunned him into an awakened condition. And he never made the statement again because he went to his room that night and he started writing. He started writing. And he never stopped until the day he died. And he died a very, very rich man, and I'm sure his kids appreciate it. But he got into a rut. Yes, his wife too. <laughs> but uh, he got into a rut. Now, we could talk about various things ad infinitum, but our text tonight deals with a man by the name of Bartimaeus, whom the Bible makes no problem, has no problem calling him blind Bartimaeus. I think that was the way he was called. It was a way of defining him. They didn't just say Bartimaeus. Which Bartimaeus? Well, you know the guy that sits. No, it was blind Bartimaeus, and everybody knew who he was. I want you to consider his seemingly inescapable, sad rut. Not of his own making, but there nonetheless. Number one, he really was indeed blind. And you must think of that day, that time, that place, that era, that world. And as such, at that time and place, 
he could not work, read, or write. I doubt he could get around very much or very far, amen, without direct, powerful assistance because his fear of, of that which was comfortable had to be very small. Number two, due to his plight, he had been reduced in life to begging, period. Except for maybe some help of his father Timotheus, if he was still alive, he was reduced to doing nothing, little else, but sitting beside the road and saying, um, um, money for the poor, money for the blind, and shake his little cup, period. Therefore, the third thing, he was an object of pity. And you do realize he lived off of sympathy. Sympathy was his currency with which he had to deal and make his way through life. If he could not touch somebody's bowels of compassion, he would starve to death. Now, I've seen people with 20 20 eyesight that lived off that entity. But he had to. And when you look at verse 46, you realize that within the last six words, there are four words that pretty well summed up his life. And I'll change the word from highway to road. He was sitting by the road. Period. That was his life. Blind, pretty helpless, lived off sympathy, and he sat by the road of life. Life passed him by. People passed him by all day long, every day, every week, every month, every moment of his life except when he could escape through sleep. And when you stop and consider, again, that his plight was basically inescapable. Amen. But he did do seven things. Amen, which we can do. And he got out of his rut. Hallelujah. And whatever rut, we find ourselves in the same God that got him out of his rut. That God will get us out of our rut. Because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's the Lord and he does not change. And God is no respecter of persons. But he is a respecter of attitudes. He is a respecter of outlooks. He is a respecter, amen, of, of that which we do. Or do not do. Amen. And so we need to look at it. I know there is a law of hermeneutics that states that don't ever make more than three points. Because that's all people can remember. Well, we're going to have to break the law of hermeneutics tonight. But I have confidence in Alabama's abilities. Praise God. And besides that, I'm not going to tarry very long on some of these. I'm not going to really tarry very long on any of them. Amen. Number one. He broke out of his rut by assuming responsibility for his life. Number one. Number one. Assuming responsibility. He understood that somewhere and this is that where and when it's up to me to take some initiative. There's something I've got to do, and I've got to do it right now, and I cannot wait. It's got to be done. And in that moment, and I can't get into whatever he was or was not psychologically before that moment. All I know is that after that moment, from what we find before that moment is a world of difference. 
So how he built up to it or kicked it in gear instantly, we do not know. But he assumed responsibility and he began to scream, Jesus! And then, not just content with Jesus, he defined it a little closer. Jesus, thou son of David! Have mercy on me. So he's calling on two names, two, two entities, so to speak, two, two images of, of what comes to your mind, Jesus, and then Jesus, the son of David. And I think there's a good reason for that because both Jesus and David were classic rut breakers. Amen. It's good to associate with those kind of people. Amen. David didn't like ruts. He didn't care if they were 40 days old and they were caused by a giant on the far side of the valley. Come on, army. We've got in a rut. We can't live there. We can't stay there. We've heard his bellerings 79 times and I've had all I can take and I've only heard it once. And he broke all of Israel out of a rut with five stones in the name of the Lord and Goliath's sword. Amen. Because he was a rut breaker. Then, as we mentioned last night, he took the head of that giant because he said, by the way, we've been in another rut. And it ain't 40 days, it's 400 years. And that's that city of Jebus that for whatever reason we've never seen fit to take. Well, bless your heart. Here's Goliath's head. And I may not be able to do it today, but I promise you we're going to break out of this rut. And one of these days you're going to be called the city of David because I will bring you down. We've lived in this rut long enough. Another rut that he would not put up with was the Ark of the Covenant out from where it belonged. The glory of God doesn't belong yonder, amen. The glory of God belongs in the ark. Or the ark of God belongs in the tabernacle. And bless your heart, we ain't going to live that way. We're not going to have church without the glory of God. We're not going to go through the motions without the presence of Almighty God. I want the mercy seat in my life. I want the glory of God in my world. And bless your heart, we're going to go get it. David was a rut breaker, brother. Saul didn't mind living in a rut. Amen. The army of Israel didn't mind living in a rut. The tribe of Judah didn't mind living in a rut with Jebus in their back door. But David was a rut breaker. Amen. He broke a lot of modes with worship. Now, I know there's other people prior to David that worship like David. We find them there. But we don't find nobody that worships with the consistency that David did. Even in bringing the glory of God back home, he would go six paces. He'd offer up a sacrifice. He'd dance before the Lord and he'd walk six more spaces and say, I feel like dancing again. Nobody worshiped like David worshiped. Nobody carried on like David carried on. And when stoic, stolid, amen, wife, Michael, who was Saul's daughter, didn't like the way he carried on. He said, lady, if you think it's bad today, you wait till tomorrow. I'll carry on till I embarrass myself. But bless your heart, I'm going to worship God. We're not living like that around here. We've got the king of kings as our glory standard bearer. He was a rat breaker. You know who introduced music in every service? It was David. You do not find music on a consistent basis in the worship of God until David passes off the scene. Because he said, if we do it, bless your heart, we're going to sing about it. We're going to praise him. We're going to love him. And if I can even take it this far, 
he got to looking at the tabernacle one day. I live in a nice house of cedar, and they've had that tent for all these centuries. I want to build a house exceeding magnificent to my God and my King. It's amazing the kind of ruts people can get in. It's like when old C.P. Kilgore went to Collinsville, Oklahoma years and years and years and years ago and they had the slat wood benches, no backs, just slat, good for splinters. And, and, and everything was archaic and he tried to get them to rise up and build something halfway decent for Jesus Christ. And, and they, they were stuck like in the mud. And he got up one night and he beat on the pulpit he said, if you like it so much, take it home and put it in your front room. If it's good enough for God, it ought to be good enough for you. Come on now, Summer, we better break out of some ruts. We've got a God to serve. We've got a world to win. We've got to do something that will get this job done. And so blind Bartimaeus said, Jesus, I'm in a rut, thou son of David. Have mercy on me. Cried out, amen, to the one that was turning his world upside down. And that cold, dead, lifeless, now formal templism, amen, was being replaced by a glory of God that moved all over the nation. It would come into homes and lives and hamlets and hovels. Amen. The power of Almighty God. Amen. Until Jesus' time, sickness was untouched and unchallenged. It was just the way things were. But they found somebody that said, we don't have to live that way. We don't have to live like that. You don't have to suffer. There is a God that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he heals. Whereas they had got used to demon possession. When they came to Gadara, they just walked around it. When they went to the tabern- I mean to the synagogue and the demons would sit there, they just learned to live with them. But something about when Jesus showed up, it shook their world because he's not settled. No, 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 we're not going there. We're not going to live in those kind of ruts. And then the ruts of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And we could go on and on and on and on. Loveless, lifeless, glorious relationships with God. No, no, no. I've come to break you out of that rut. We're going to have life around here. And we're going to have it more abundantly. And I am the way and the truth and the life. And bless your heart if I can take it this far. If I've got to die in order to rip that veil and let the glory of Almighty God spill out into your world, I'm going to do it. So, Bartimaeus took the initiative. Amen. The difference between a child and a grown-up is more than just size. The number one single difference is a grown-up assumes responsibility. Children simply are not there yet. That's why immature people never come to the place they assume responsibility. Immature people, it's always somebody else's fault. Somebody else's problem. Somebody else has got to fix that. Somebody else has got to... No, 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 no. A mature person says, I am a responsible party. I can pray, I can talk to God, I can call on Jesus, the son of David, and bless your heart, amen, I've let life pass me by long enough, I've sat by the road of life, man, I'm not going to live that way anymore. He assumed some responsibility, he took some initiative, and he said, Jesus, the son of David, have 
have mercy on me. The second thing that he did to break out of his seemingly inescapable rut was you got to believe that you can change. You got to believe that he'll break you out. Now, he'd obviously heard of Jesus. When he said, What's going on? What's going on? What's, what's, what's going on? They said, It's Jesus. Now, if they'd have said, Well, it's Zacchaeus, the tax collector, unless he was owed back taxes, he wouldn't have said, Have mercy on me. But when he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, the son of David, he had obviously heard some things about Jesus. He had prior knowledge and of what Jesus would do for others. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And something in him said, you know, I can change because if he did it for others, Bless your heart, he'll do it for me. If he broke them out of a rut, he'll, he'll do it for me. Hallelujah. Now, and I'm going to ride piggyback a little bit on what, on what Brother Wilson was telling us today. Can, can I just put it to you this wise? We need to rejoice with them that rejoice. Brother Wilson, I'm thrilled when I hear the Jet 69 people get the Holy Ghost in one service because if God did it for them, my same God will do it for me. You gotta rejoice with them that rejoice. You gotta get excited. My God's still alive, He'll do it for me. And I've not had 69 get the Holy Ghost in one night. But about three and a half, four years ago, Brother Keys called me. And he said, Larry, I had a dream, and I just thought I'd tell you about it. I said, tell me. He said, in this dream, I saw your church, and I saw 40 people get the Holy Ghost in one night. And I could have said, well, that's easy for you to say. But I want you to know my heart did a flip. And it did take a few years. But this, and and when it happened, I, I missed it. We had 41 get the Holy Ghost in one night. And Joel came up to me the next day and he said, Brother Key's dream came true. We had 41 get the whole. Hey, brother, come on now. If God did it for somebody else, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You got to believe you can get out of your rut. You got to believe that you can change and that things can change. Number three. If you're going to break out of a rut, you got to clarify what rut you want out of. What you need. And Jesus knows that. And that's why he said to a blind man sitting on the side road with a cup. What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? What if he just said... Oh, just whatever you think I need. What if he just said, I got a bunion on my left foot? Let's start there. Bless your heart. He said, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? Lord, that I should receive my sight. I want these eyes to see. You got to clarify what you want. I remember years and years ago, old brother C.A. Nelson, uh, this will let you know how long ago, 
his reference point was, he said when he was a young man involved in the work of God, he needed a penny, just a penny, but it was in the middle of the depression, and he didn't have a penny, but he had a letter he needed to mail, and you could mail a letter for a penny. Got the picture? But he said, I ain't got a penny. He said, God, this letter is for the work of God. I need a penny. He said, within five minutes, there was a knock at the door. He opened up the door, and there was a little boy standing there with a penny in his hand. He said, Brother Nelson, here is a penny for you. He said, I was down the street, and I found two of them. And I ran to my daddy, and I showed them to my daddy. And my daddy said, well, you keep one, and you take one to Preacher Nelson down there. He wasn't in church. He said, take one to Preacher Nelson down there. He said, he may have a letter he needs to mail or something. And Brother Nelson said, I don't know why I don't pray for a million dollars. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I never forgot that. Remember years ago, I had to pay for some, well, let me back up a little minute. I was preaching in Phoenix, Arizona. My, my youngest son, Larry Andy, was with me. And, and, and we were fixing to leave. We'd packed up. And, uh, but in the morning when I first woke up, I had a pair of glasses on the, Nightstand, Larry was in bed across the way. I picked up my glasses and the earpiece fell off because the little screw fell out of the glasses. So I get down there and hold the glasses up and I'm feeling around on the floor for that little screw. I can't find I said, Jesus, help me find that screw. I don't want to go around looking stupid. Help me. Help me, God, help me. I couldn't find that screw for nothing. I was looking everywhere. So... I didn't spend 10 years for nothing. So I got some, a needle, and a straight pin, put it in, bent it up. They hung on my face, but at least I could see. And we were going out the door, and I just wanted to check one more time if I'd left anything in the room. And, I, and there was a game token on the nightstand, and I picked up the game token. It fell out of my hands, rolled under the bed, and I said, oh, well. And I was halfway out the door, and the Lord spoke to me and said, I thought you wanted the screw for your glasses. God knows I'm telling the truth. And I said, Larry Andy, you know that little screw from my glasses? He said, yes. I said, I'm fixing to find it. And I knew, I don't know where that game token is, but I knew wherever it was. I got down on my knees and I started feeling under that bed. Now how that token rolled that far and how the screw got that far, I have no idea. But I kept feeling, 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 and I felt the token, and I started feeling right around it, and there was that little tiny screw from my glasses. You got to believe he'll give you what you're asking for. And a couple of months later, my tax bill was coming due, and I owed $2,500, and I had 500 And I thought I was rich because I had 500 And they wanted 2000 more. And I said, God, you gave me that little screw for my glasses, and you can give me the money for those taxes. And, and when I prayed that, I was, I was fixing to go down off the hill where I'd pray back there in AG, and... And I opened up my Bible in the bright, bright moonlight, and I looked down, and I saw the place where Jesus caught a fish. I said, Peter, go catch a fish. You'll find a coin in the mouth. Pay taxes for me. And, the, and I read that, and I said, yes, Lord. I'm going to do your work. I'm going to do your will. I'm going about the master's business. And you're going to take care of that because I believe you. Amen. And then within a few days, a man walked up to me. He was in our church, and, and he struggled with money like big time. And he, he, he said, Pastor, I've got to give you something. And, and he was hurting. It was like pain. 
He said, the Lord told me to give this to you. And he, and he, and he, he stumbled away, you know. And I opened it up, and it was $1,200. And that's good. I said, God, I, that's awesome. I only need 800 more. Hallelujah. And the tax man was coming the next few days, and the same man came up to me with an even greater pained expression. And he said, Pastor, the Lord spoke to me again here. And he died shortly thereafter. He's a good man, though. He really was. And I opened it up, and it was $800. Now, I I hesitate to say what I'm about to say because I know what it's like to think that your life depends on finding something in the mail today. I know that feeling and it not be there and not be there next week or next month. We've all been there. So when I say what I'm about to say, doesn't negate any of that. Somehow, I don't know how I made it and here we are today. But I never forgot that. And I remember a few years ago, I needed $25,000 and I said, God, I need $25,000. And if you're able to give me that little tiny screw under the bed and you're able to give me that, that, that $2,000, you're able to take care of that. You own a cattle on a thousand hills. Sell a cow, sell a big cow. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something within 30 days time from here and there and outside and up and down. I didn't know where it came from, but over and above and beyond at the end of the month, I had $25,000 and I paid for it. And so then a few years later, I needed $45,000. And I said, now, come on now, God, you're the same. Yes. And you can give me that 45,000 and listen closely. I said, you know, God, I wouldn't have to ask you for it if I hadn't have given it away many times over. You say you're haughty. No, it's a truth. And he knew it was the truth. I said, so I know you can help me. I'm not being ugly, but you know, if I hadn't have given it away, I could have had that in a whole lot more. So about three, four, five, four months later, I was fixing to go preach. And that message I was going to preach that night was, he's an on-time God. I wasn't even thinking about that. I just, he's an on-time God. Well, I was not on time for church that night. But he's an on-time God. And so I was fixing to rush up there. And somebody said, sister so-and-so wants to talk to you. Sister so-and-so wants to talk to you. And I said, I said can she wait till after church? And she says it's really important right now. And I thought, well, I got a message. I got to go preach. I got to preach about he's an on time God. And, but I, I went and I, I sit down back and I said, what is it, sis? How you doing? She's a dear heart, precious dear lady, Sister Marie. And uh, she said, well, here, honey, I got something to give you. I said, okay, thank you so much. And, and, I, and I love you. And I, and, I, and, I, and I got up there and, and I was being introduced to preach. And my assistant and and I just thought, I'd, I've got, I've got to preach he's an on-time God. And I, and I happened to look what she gave me, and it was a check for $45,000. He is an on-time God. I'm telling you, you've got to get clear. You've got to clarify. You've got to assume responsibility. You've got to believe you can change, and you've got to clarify what it is you want and what it is you need. <laughs> and now we're about to undertake a horrific building deal. Do you believe I'm praying? But I believe there's an on-time God and he's going to somehow take care of us. All right, number four, and I'm going to move on. If you're going to break out of the ruts of life, another thing you got to do is stop worrying about what people are going to say. 
If you got to scream all day long, Jesus, the Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, the Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, the Son of David. Who cares if they don't like it? You're the one that's got the need. Fear of disapproval is a major rut keeper. Amen. It kept 11 out of the 12 disciples in the boat. But Simon Peter said, if that's you, bid me come. And he didn't get into a long, exegetical, and then hermeneutical, theological, as said Jesus. He said, come. And he took off his shoes. And I can just see James and John and Simon, Simon, Simon. What? You are five foot ten. You are 185 pounds. You got a size 12 foot. The density of your body compared to the density of this is not the Dead Sea. This is Galilee. And when you step out on that water, there's just a whole lot's fixing to happen to you. And when you sink, we will smile. And somewhere you got to say, I don't care what you think. I've been in this ride long enough, and he told me to come on. So here I come. And some folks are more than happy to say, yeah, but he sank. He got to looking around at the wind and the waves and he sank. Well, there's another flip side to that, Bubba. Jesus picked him up and walked him back to the boat. If you've got enough faith and guts to get out there, he's got enough goodness to see you home. we got to break out of some rocks. New American Standard said many were sternly telling him to be quiet. Be quiet. But the Bible said he cried out the more. Jesus, the son of David. And don't ever forget, people are fickle anyway. Because when Jesus stopped, He said, bring him to me. The same crowd was sternly telling him to shut up. Now said, the Lord calleth for thee. Here he is, Lord. I got stuff I can say right now, but it probably wouldn't be edifying. It's amazing how many people can tell you how beautiful your building is now, isn't it? Before they were saying, you're going to sink, Bubba. You, you're going you're gonna to die. It's going to kill you. And now it's, boy, this is really nice. You know why I get excited about gorgeous, awesome, wonderful buildings? I'm going to take this a step further. I preached in a church that was building a magnificent, breathtaking building. I was there three nights. I bragged on those people all three nights. I said, what you're doing is for the name of Jesus. This is a one God, Jesus name, apostolic holiness. What you're doing is something so profound, and I bragged on them. And on the way to the airport, 
with tears in his eyes, the pastor said, you're the first one to say one thing about it in our pulpit. Come on, how petty can we be? If we expect to start breaking out of some ruts, I'm going to tell you something. There better be something. We better be breaking out of our own ruts. So number five, and I'm almost done. You've got to stop waiting for ideal circumstances to break out of your rut. If you sit around waiting for the just right time and the just right day and the just right moment, I'm gonna tell you, you may sit there forever. Bartimaeus, he could have said, I will wait for a more convenient season. He could have said, maybe he'll back this way tomorrow. He could have said, I'm going to wait till next week. Brother, that's classic rut dweller language. you got to stop and make up your mind. Thou is today. It's all I've got promised to me. Jesus, thou son of David. Number six, musicians come. Don't do nothing, just come. You gotta do something bold. You gotta do something dramatic. He stood up. He took his cloak and he threw it. He said to somebody, point me in the right direction. You gotta do it now, and you gotta do it with boldness. I made mention last night. There is a doctrine of crying out. Exodus 15:25, very quickly. He cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And Moses cried! the Lord and God showed him a tree Psalms 39 12 hear my prayer O Lord hear my prayer O Lord and give ear unto my cry and give ear to my cry hold not thy peace Don't at my hold tears. Your peace. I'm a stranger with thee and a sojourner 55 as- 17 Evening and morning, at noon will I pray. Evening, morning, noon will I pray. And cry aloud. Do what? And cry aloud. There is a doctrine of crying out. I'm here to tell you, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, that's about three of hundreds. you got to cry out. you got to cry out. Mark 10, verse 48. And many charged him. They that, charged him. That he should hold his peace. Come on, Bartimaeus, you've got to hold your peace. But he cried out. But the, he cried out. The more. The more I'm not going to shut up, Jesus, the son of David. And I'm stopped. If you're going to break out of your rut. Number seven. You got to make your move now. You got to make your move now. He had no idea Jesus was coming to town that day. He had no idea. It was just suddenly there. You got to make your move now. We're going to hear more because we, I'm going to take, I'm going to stop this. But for right now, if you've got a need and you want God to come down right now, step out where you are and get down the business. Jesus, the Son of David, have mercy on me. Break me out of the rut. Break me out of this problem. Break me out. God, I'm going to do it. 